I believe that we are going to get along with the Russian people very, very well. The Iron Curtain has descended across the country in media and resolute action. I shall go to Korea. I am not and never have been a member of the Communist that Party. We shall pay any price, bear any burden, support any friend. He believes that peace is at hand. Will be regarded as an assault on the vital interests of the United We understand each other better. And that's a key to peace. The Eagle and the Bear. Dispatches from the Cold War. Dateline, 1975, Cambodia. April 1st. For nearly 10 years, Cambodia was a sideshow. Vietnam held center stage in the American war in Indochina. Americans were evacuating Vietnam, and now it seemed that Cambodia too would fall. U.S. supporters including President Lon Nol, were fleeing. In the countryside outside of Phnom Penh, Cambodian communists, the fanatic, violent child soldiers of the Khmer Rouge, waited for their moment. years, Cambodian kings, who call themselves the Khmers, ruled Southeast Asia. In the 12th century, they built the Angkor Wat, a massive stone monument to Cambodian culture. But by the 19th century, the Khmer Empire had crumbled. Cambodia became a French protectorate lumped together with Vietnam and Laos as part of French Indochina. It wasn't until 1954 that Vietnamese communist troops finished their war against the French with a final victory at Dien Bien Phu. There, the Vietnamese slaughtered thousands and put an end forever to French colonial rule. And in Geneva, where world powers met to draw the terms of peace, Cambodia was recognized as an independent and neutral state. In the Cambodian capital, Phnom Penh, Prince Nordam Sihanouk enjoyed the fruits of peace. Enormously popular, revered as a god king, he led a prosperous independent nation. Sihanouk accepted U.S. economic and military aid, but firmly maintained Cambodian neutrality. War broke out in Vietnam again in 1960, and this time, the Khmer paradise was sucked in. South Vietnam troops have stepped up their attacks on Viet Cong rebels in recent weeks an action that has red guerrilla bands trapped in a pocket near the border of Cambodia. By 1963, the U.S. was involved in Vietnam. That year, South Vietnamese leader Ngo Dinh Diem was overthrown and murdered, and the U.S. had a direct hand in the coup. Sihanouk, fearing for his own future, renounced all American aid. Communist leaders in Beijing and Hanoi began to court him. They believed he could prevent American expansion into Cambodia. They hailed him as a friend of communism. But he was no friend at home. Cambodian communists were murdered or driven into the jungle. Repressing domestic communism 
and embracing international communism. Sihanouk became known as the prince on a tightrope. In 1967, the unpredictable Sihanouk made a new friendly gesture toward the U.S. He invited former First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy to Cambodia. He dedicated a boulevard to her late husband. Je pense que c'est parce que les peuples et les nations à travers le monde reconnaissent que tel était son dessein suprême. Sihanouk thanked Americans. But Vietnamese communists were desperate for new supply routes into South Vietnam. They pressured Sihanouk, and he finally gave them access to a Cambodian port. One by one, Viet Cong bases and sanctuaries appeared on Cambodian soil. Sihanouk claimed to be helpless. With some 10,000 men along the Cambodian-Vietnamese frontiers, how do you expect us to make it waterproof against the Viet Cong? when with all your combined forces and extraordinary weight of material, you cannot do it. Early in March of 1970, a rumor circulated that a white crocodile had been sighted in Phnom Penh. The white crocodile, a powerful symbol in Khmer mythology, is said to appear only when Cambodia is at a crossroads. Within days, Prince Nordam Sihanouk was ousted in a right-wing coup led by Lan No. One of the oldest monarchies in the world had fallen. The Nixon administration was pleased. We didn't want a neutralist in Phnom Penh. We wanted somebody on our side, and these were pro-Western generals and, and politicians. And we began pumping first small arms and then heavier stuff into them to build uh, light infantry divisions. But Lan No had taken over a divided Cambodia. Sihanouk had alienated the communists, the militarists, and powerful Buddhists. Lan No, a Buddhist himself, thought he could unify the country. did not have much time. The war next door was closing on Cambodia. May 9, 1969. The New York Times revealed Operation Breakfast, the secret first U.S. bombing of communist camps inside Cambodia. Early in 1970, U.S. helicopters ferried South Vietnamese soldiers into Cambodia, delivering them to clean out communist sanctuaries. For the past five years, as indicated on this map that you see here, North Vietnam, has occupied military sanctuaries all along the Cambodian frontier with South Vietnam. Tonight, American and South Vietnamese units will attack the headquarters for the entire communist military operation in South Vietnam. I consider the enemy as a common enemy, where they are. If they are inside our territory, we destroy them. Now, if they are in Cambodian territory, we strike them also. But the invasion was carried out without the knowledge or approval of Cambodian leader Lan No. And many Americans objected. Protests against the U.S. missions into Cambodia led to riots and to the May 4th, 1970 killing at Kent State. 
the U.S. Congress moved swiftly to prohibit the use of American dollars for ground operations in Cambodia. This strikes me, this is a widening of the war, and it is a very serious uh, uh, enlargement of our responsibilities. In 1971, Lan Nol was almost killed by a stroke. Against all odds, he recovered and consolidated power. But by the end of the year, after a disastrous offensive against the communists, his army was broken, his government riddled with corruption. Lan Nol led a republic standing on its last legs. On January 27, 1973, the United States and North Vietnam signed the Paris Peace Accords. The United States was now prohibited in Vietnam and Laos, and Cambodia became the focal point of the war. Pledging that no one would see Nixon let Cambodia go down the drain, the president unleashed a new American air war. It was the heaviest bombing of the Vietnam War, the Indochina War. These were B-52s dropping, you know, 20-ton loads and, and leveling little villages. So it was everywhere, and it was heavy. Cambodians were made homeless. The bombing destroyed rice paddies, and people went hungry. Cambodia's band of communists, the Khmer Rouge, used the bombing to good advantage. They were a ragtag group. And by giving them a war to feed on, we, in a sense, provided the, the nurturing, the fertilizer, to help that tree grow. And that tree was this maniac group. Khmer Rouge soldiers captured weapons and celebrated victory. But their leaders were bitter. Years of neglect by their communist allies and the utter devastation from American bombs twisted their psychology. A small band of unknown leaders imposed harsh, strict rules on those they led. Prince Sihanouk was exiled in Beijing. Chinese leaders brokered a coalition between the prince and the Khmer Rouge. Moscow believed that uh, we are uh, the puppets of Mao Zedong, but we are not the puppets of China. We are Cambodians. And if we shed blood, and uh, the Cambodian resistance shed blood since uh, uh, more than three years already, it is just for Cambodia. It is not for China. On August 15, 1973, the American bombing stopped. In Vietnam, the U.S. was defeated. And now in Cambodia, Cambodian communists would have their hour. Early in 1975, the Khmer Rouge began their final drive for Phnom Penh. To many Cambodians, there would be no return. We did not want to get into this war. One way or the other, we were dragged, dragged into it. And the only wish that we are having now is to get out of the conflict. On April 1st, President Lan Nol fled, and 12 days later, U.S. Ambassador John Gunther Dean followed. Without looking back, America left Cambodia. I think it's tragic for a nation to come at this stage and to have lost so many lives, so many properties, and to have to go back so many years uh, in history. So for me, it's the saddest day of my life. But the next day, April 17th, proved sadder. The Khmer Rouge captured Phnom Penh. They evacuated the capital. Two million people, including thousands of hospital patients, were forced onto the road and marched into the countryside. Many people in my country thought that on April 17, 1975, with the Khmer Rouge victory, we might return again to peace. But in just a few hours after the Khmer Rouge had taken over, the cheering had turned to horror, and the Cambodian was living in a nightmare. 
a hell beyond words. The whole city, all two million people, including the wounded in the hospitals, and there were thousands of wounded, people in surgery having uh, arms and legs amputated, moved off out of the surgery into the streets um, to die in the streets, all the wounded from all the hospitals, all the civilians uh, living in town were uh, sent out into the countryside. Every city is dead. There are no people, only a few soldiers. It's just a dead city and a dead country. These correspondents and almost all foreigners had just been escorted out. A country the West now called Democratic Cappuccia sealed its borders. And America, tired of the war in Indochina, turned its back. Prince Sihanouk made a show of returning to his homeland to join the Khmer Rouge. Almost immediately, he was put under house arrest. A little-known guerrilla leader named Pol Pot ran the party and the country. A new constitution banned all foreign trade, abolished money, and guaranteed only two human rights, the right to defend the country and the right to work. This Khmer Rouge propaganda film shows happy, healthy workers. In reality, the nation was a forced labor camp, the conditions inhuman. Men, women, and children were separated, families destroyed. Children six years old or older were taken from their parents. They give no food, no meat, no pork, no vegetable. So how could the people can be survive? Day by day, people were killed, and day by day, people was die. There was terror. In the morning, I go to work sometime. I see dead people in the rice field, and I wonder you know, what happened. And I knew that got to be something happened last night. And my mouth had to be sealed. And I believe in my dream that the one as a lady, you know, dressed white and told me if I want to be alive, I had to seal my mouth. 20,000 people entered the gates of Tool Slang Interrogation Center while Pol Pot was in power and only a few survived. Three times I was imprisoned and tortured. Once they cut off my fingertip. Once they gave me a Chinese water torture. Once they hang me up on a cross for three days without food or water. In January of 1979, Vietnam captured Phnom Penh putting an end to Pol Pot's reign of terror. Ironically, the regime the U.S. had fought against and lost to was riding in to save its neighbor. Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge moved back to the Cambodian jungle. In four years, Pol Pot had killed as many as three million Cambodians. The America once intent on saving Cambodia from communism barely noticed. 
we didn't do very much. We, of course, denounced the killings. We adopted a resolution. The president issued statements. But there really was no effort on the part of either the United States or the international community to bring the killing to an end. So in a place that had once been a temple, they make a world camp. The old temple wall was covered with blood, and the space was filled with screaming of children. Life, one human life, means nothing. They would play, they would... They even play game with the dead. Cambodia, a nation destroyed in the conflict between the eagle and the bear. Thank <laughs> you.